Hi everyone, my name is Ryan. Uh, I'm going to share on behalf of my wonderful co authors, Pedro and Patricia Jeff. And I'm going to talk about our system integration model. AI. Uh, so recently there's been a ton of AI auditing and protections in the city. Legislation uh, proposed worldwide in the US environmental level, uh, both at the federal and state levels. Uh, and generally speaking, these bills uh, require evaluations of AI systems. To ensure they meet our expectations. Thank you. Um, yeah, oh, perfect, much better. Okay. Um, and generally speaking, these bills, um, they require evaluations of AI systems uh, to ensure they meet our expectations for safety, fairness, and, and other sort of social values. Um, and my co-authors and I have been uh, doing or thinking about evaluations of AI systems for a while now, and we've noticed that in practice, these AI audits don't always live up to our expectations. Um, you know, for example, some early research suggests that compliance with um, a New York City uh, bias auditing law, for example, has been pretty lackluster, uh, partly because of um, narrow definitions of systems being audited and, and other issues. Um, and more generally, we know that um, uh, uh, from prior work that effective auditing is, is very hard to do. Um, and so even as AI audits become widespread, um, they may not hold companies and governments accountable and lead to meaningful responsive change. Uh, so in this paper, we sort of asked um, the larger question of um, what does AI audit practice look like right now? And how can audits uh, consistently contribute to this goal of, of accountability? Um, and I try to start answering those questions, at least. Uh, we did two things. Uh, the first was a, a literature review of audit work happening in academia. Um, and there we sort of found that despite a lot of uh, really great AI evaluation work that gets published in computing conferences, um, work that uh, gives us new methods, advances our understanding of AI systems, um, it's rare to find changes that uh, changes to deployed products that directly resulted from these studies. Uh, it happens, but it doesn't happen all the time. Um, and we also found that a lot of these academic audit studies focus a lot on the products and the models and the algorithms involved with these systems. Um, only a few of them look beyond those products and models to look at sort of the data sets used to train these systems. Um, and then only a few studies um, uh, look beyond those products and models at the entire ecosystem, the socio-technical ecosystem of affected stakeholders that are um, impacted by or that are required to make these systems run. Um, and uh, of course, audit work doesn't only happen in academia. So the, the second thing we did uh, was to look at other domains where AI audit work is happening. Uh, journalism, civil society, uh, government, uh, consulting firms, law firms. Um, and in some of those domains, we saw a much wider range of methods being used, especially qualitative methods. Um, and we also saw um, more concrete impacts happening more frequently and more, more dramatically in those domains. Um, and so what we did was we tried to sort of compare these two uh, different areas of auditing um, and write down some characteristics of what we think are, are impactful audits. Um, and so I'll today sort of go over some of the ways that practitioners and policymakers uh, could make AI auditing more effective. Before I go into the results, I want to uh, stop and, and mention that the term audit is uh, used a lot differently in, in different places. Um, so, so here we're, we, we sort of wrote down our own definition of an audit that we used to guide this study. Um, and the, the really important things are that we looked for audits or, or studies that involved uh, independent assessments. So this is either by external organizations or by internal teams uh, separate from the people building the model and operating the model. Um, we looked for an identified audit target. This is usually a specific deployed system, um, or it's like a popular open source model uh, that lots of people are using. Um, and we looked for an objective of accountability, uh, which means we looked for evaluations that aim to inform consequential judgments about the systems that they're auditing. Uh, this could be like with specific recommendations uh, for changes to the product or for policies. Um, this could be explicit calls for operators to change their practices. Um, and so using that definition of an audit, uh, we went and looked at papers published in commuting conferences between 2018 and 2022. Uh, so this is not representative of audit work in other fields, uh, which is worth mentioning, uh, places like sociology or economics where audit work also happens. Um, and we looked through all these papers. Uh, we looked specifically at papers um, at conferences. We thought there would be a lot of uh, auditing work, you know, FACT, AIS, 
Um, then we also did keyword filtering on larger anthologies like the ACM Digital Library um, and the ACM uh, Anthology. Um, and then with all those papers that met our definition of an audit that I just showed you, um, we did some content and thematic analysis to describe and taxonomize those studies. Um, and when we could, we also looked for like news coverage, tweets, um, other public records that could describe the impact of these studies. Uh, though I will say that that kind of evidence is, is hard to find for a lot of the things we looked at. Um, uh, so one of the main things that we did that I'll talk about today was to try and develop a taxonomy of audit scope. Um, and at first we started sorting all the papers into uh, audits of models and audits of data sets, because that's something that we, we felt like we saw a lot. Um, in practice, there was a lot more uh, nuance in the papers we looked at. So there were audits of uh, AI-driven products and, and features, so like YouTube recommendation or YouTube content moderation, um, audits of models, so like an IRS tax model, um, audits of the algorithms used to train those models, and then finally audits of the data sets uh, or benchmarks like ImageNet, for example, um, that are used to train the models. And what we found was that all these product model algorithm audits were the, the bulk of the papers we found um, by far. Uh, for most of them, it was hard, as I mentioned, to find those concrete changes or other consequences um, that happen in the, the identified audit target um, that resulted directly from those evaluation results. And when there was like a clear impact, it usually came from like media coverage or activism surrounding uh, those results. So for example, the, the gender shades audit, which led to a, a moratorium on facial recognition technology at um, some large tech companies is, is a good example of some of that press coverage and activism that surrounds the results of an audit. Um, it's, it was also possible in some cases for uh, in an industry collaboration, uh, you could see um, changes to the product that resulted from research that happened uh, in collaboration with the company. Um, um, on the other hand, uh, this sort of additional area of auditing that we found uh, that was a little bit exciting um, are what we're calling uh, ecosystem audits. And they've been uh, growing in the couple in the last sort of couple of years, though they still compose a very small portion of the papers that we looked at. Um, and in those uh, ecosystem audits, um, the authors will focus not just on the products and the models and the algorithms, but on the communities and the stakeholders that are affected by those products and models and algorithms. Um, so for example, in Allegheny County where I live, uh, where Pittsburgh is, um, there is this child welfare service algorithm that has been much discussed. Um, and uh, one study did a great job of uh, actually going out and doing workshops with the families um, that are affected by the algorithm, the employees that are required to use the algorithm, um, getting their uh, uh, feedback on what they expect of the system uh, and, and how they like it to work and how they, how they feel it works for them. Um, and so these, these ecosystem audits um, uh, tended to mention specific application domains like child welfare services uh, more often. Um, they were also more likely, um, unsurprisingly, to employ these participatory and inclusive methods uh, to get those affected stakeholders involved in the process. Um, and these studies um, also, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, tended to produce more concrete and systematic demands. Um, uh, so for example, one study of uh, facial recognition technology uh, in England and Wales, uh, they actually went out and got feedback from community stakeholders from the beginning of the study. They used it to design the sort of objectives from their audit. And then when they finished, um, those audit results were, were cited in uh, local municipal uh, motions to ban facial recognition technology. Uh, so they, they grounded in sort of what those community stakeholders thought and then uh, it ended up resulting in, in, in some impact in that local area. So I mentioned that um, direct impacts were, were hard to find or less frequent in academia, um, but outside academia, uh, the effects of auditing were much more frequent and dramatic sometimes, especially in certain domains. And so the next thing we sort of did was to look at audit reports, uh, websites, uh, legal filings, other like public documents we could find, uh, which sometimes could be hard, especially for like uh, consulting or certain law firms where a lot of their work is confidential. Um, and um, for these sort of 16 organizations, um, we tried to get a good like theoretical representation of the different kinds of groups that work in these different areas of auditing. Um, and one of the biggest things we noticed with the documents that we were able to find uh, was that um, audit work by some uh, organizations had uh, different motivations than others. And there was this sort of split in motivation that I'll describe to you. Uh, law firms, I think, are a good example. Because on the one hand, you have these uh, sort of legal consulting firms uh, that frame their work as, as managing the risks of AI for their clients and sort of meeting their clients' uh, risk needs. Um, and then on the other hand, they have their organizations like uh, Fox Club, which is a legal nonprofit, um, 
uh, where their goal is to sort of represent those affected users, um, those who are impacted by algorithm systems. Um, and so their, their, low, their motto is, uh, we stand up to tech giants and governments. And you can sort of see that split uh, in other domains too. So like news organizations like The Markup, uh, we are watching big tech. Um, and then on the other hand, um, uh, you know, consulting agencies, um, sometimes they have like lofty missions, but often the services that they provide are very focused on uh, managing risk for their clients. They're focused on compliance, focused on disparate impact. Um, and we also saw that that split was sort of reflected in the methods that these organizations were using. Um, so in those domains where audit work was more oriented towards uh, representing affected stakeholders, uh, similar to that sort of ecosystem lens from academia, um, we saw a wider range of, uh, of methods not usually seen in academic audit work. So investigative reporting, uh, testimony, community organizing, um, data visualization, artistic data visualization, filmmaking even. Um, and then in those domains, we also saw some of the most visible and, and sort of uh, radical impacts. Um, so news articles triggering uh, regulatory action and changes to platforms, uh, lawsuits resulting in injunctions and moratoriums on, on certain algorithms that were causing uh, harms. Um, uh, and in the case of the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, even fines and, and data deletion orders uh, in the case where an agency had uh, a regular author regulatory authority. Um, and it's worth noting again that those uh, consulting, uh, some of the legal work is, is confidential, so the impacts could be hard to see. They could be there, but they're hard to see. Uh, but we do think that there's a connection between this sort of ecosystem lens um, and these kinds of, of, of diverse methods uh, and the, the impact that these organizations have been able to achieve. So there's a lot more detail in the paper, um, but I think a few sort of takeaways from the analysis we did. Um, first and foremost for practitioners, so uh, academics like me who do like audit work as part of our, our daily research, um, I think first and foremost, we'd love to see this uh, more of this ecosystem lens in, in auditing. So audits that consider and interact with the broader socio-technical system, uh, not just that, that API that you can get access to. Um, and obviously that's hard to do, but it's, um, it's, we, we found it's been effective and produced these really cool papers. Um, and uh, one way to do that is to sort of try and incorporate a wider range of creative audit methodologies, uh, you know, interviewing, um, organizing, community consultation, um, possibly and hopefully by combining our strengths as, you know, computing researchers uh, with those in other fields and those outside academia, you know, at civil society organizations uh, that are doing these kind, this kind of work. Um, I'll also mention that we noticed, and, and prior work has also noticed, that impactful audits tended to have uh, more specific targets. So they would name specific systems. Um, they would have very specific objectives, um, hopefully grounded in, in the things that people care about, um, and then uh, specific expectations for change. So specific calls for change based on the results. Um, and that's something, yeah, as I mentioned, that's been pointed out in, in prior work. Um, now, uh, it's not all on uh, you as an individual practitioner. There are also things that uh, AI audit policy, I showed you that slide of all those AI audit policies. Uh, there are things that policymakers can do to support practitioners. Um, for one, uh, AI audits can empower auditors to be more effective. Uh, so by protecting their ability to define audit scope, um, uh, protecting their ability to obtain and scrape data, which is especially an issue for those external auditors, um, and protecting their ability to share results. Um, and then finally, um, uh, giving auditors authority to, to, to act on their results. Uh, so for ICO, for example, having the authority to issue a data deletion order um, helps that audit be uh, actually consequential. Um, and um, uh, I'll also mention that policymakers can invest in uh, resources and tools that will help auditors uh, with crucial tasks beyond just this evaluation step. Um, so the other sort of half of this project with these co-authors is a study of um, some of the different stages of audit work and the tools that are available to support it. And we find that things like harms discovery, so getting a sense for what harms exist, um, communicating the results of an audit, advocating on the basis of those results, um, those things are less well supported um, and auditors have uh, less resources to help them with those things. Uh, so investment there would be nice. Um, and then finally, I'll wrap up by mentioning that, that auditing uh, can only do so much for us. Um, uh, policy should also consider uh, blanket bans, um, uh, privacy regulations, other broader sort of structural reforms. Um, but, I, but I am hopeful that um, AI auditing, especially auditing that takes into account this ecosystem lens and, and wish additional support from, from policy um, can be a, a useful tool for, for meaningful accountability. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Yeah.